Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Thank you very, very much for joining us today uh, for this in our series of 2010-2011 Millennium Lectures. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the co-sponsor of today's lecture, the Office for Undergraduate Studies, and specifically Associate Provost Donna Eckel, who leads those very important efforts. Donna, thank you for all you do. Now, the theme of this year's Millennium Lecture Series is issues in US public higher education. And we've invited distinguished speakers to share with us their perspectives on such issues as closing educational achievement gaps across demographic groups, preparing a competitive 21st century workforce, serving as a catalyst for regional economic development, and developing more sustainable funding models. With us today is Hillary Pennington, Director of Education, Post-Secondary Success, and Special Initiatives for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She leads a broad range of post-secondary education initiatives, as well as efforts around one-time opportunities to respond to unique challenges and unanticipated events in this country. Before joining the foundation, Ms. Pennington served as a senior fellow at the progressive think tank, the Center for America, American Progress, and as a president and CEO of Jobs for the Future, a research and policy development organization she co-founded. In her 22 years at Jobs for the Future, she helped the organization become one of the most influential in the country on issues of education, youth transitions, workforce development, and future work requirements. She also played a leading role in the development of early college high schools. And I can't resist mentioning here that UTEP's enrollment of talented early college high school students is growing rapidly. Thanks to the fine partnership that we have with our colleagues in the school districts and at the El Paso Community College. And it's my pleasure to welcome today my partner in all of this, the president of the El Paso Community College, Richard Rhodes. Richard, thank you very much for being here. This accelerated pathway toward attaining a bachelor's degree is ideally suited for students from this region who save both time and financial resources by earning both their high school diplomas and their associate's degrees concurrently while in high school. Some of these remarkable young people have actually completed their associate's degrees before finishing high school, and they enter UTEP as juniors while completing their senior year in high school. What's even more impressive is that some of them will graduate from UTEP within one year of graduating from high school, and they'll have remaining financial aid eligibility to pursue their graduate degrees. Just love that. Ms. Pennington also served on President Bill Clinton's transition team and as co-chair of his Presidential Advisory Committee on Technology. She's a graduate of the Yale School of Management and Yale College, she holds a graduate degree in social anthropology from Oxford University and was a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government in 2000. Please join me in extending a warm UTEP welcome to Hillary Pennington. Well, good afternoon. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. I have wanted to come to El Paso. This is my first time in El Paso, and I've wanted to come here for years because I have read about and admired the work that you all are doing um, literally for the past 10 or 15 years. And it's extraordinary to see a community that's come together and sustained the kinds of changes and innovations in education attainment that you all have done. Um, so really, great pleasure and great honor to be here. And uh, I, I hope we may have some time for real conversation and questions and answers after my talk because I have so much to learn from you that I want to take back with me to the foundation and to the work that we, all, that we are doing uh, there and across the country. And I also jumped at the chance to come because it was a chance to spend time with two of my great heroes, um, Diana. Uh, whom I first met when I was a judge for the McGraw Prize in, when she won that prize in 1997, long time. And then Richard Rhodes, who has been a key partner and hero in, for all of his leadership in early college high schools and uh, community colleges. So thanks for, uh, for the opportunity to be, to be here um, with you. 
I'm going to start out by talking a little bit just about how we sort of understand the context of what's happening in higher education in the country and why we at the Gates Foundation are so passionate about the kinds of students that you serve here at UTEP. You know, it's to sort of state the obvious, these are tough times in American communities and in American higher education. Budgets are down, enrollments are up, and the costs of delivering programs and services that you uh, face are rising faster than the public resources to support you. And I think one of the greatest dangers at a time like this is that it will become harder and harder for people to gain access to higher education. And when you think about the changing demographics in this country and the challenges of a global knowledge environment, that would be a terrible thing for our country. Because higher education represents the unshakable core of the American dream, that education, and especially education beyond high school, provides a path to upward mobility for everyone, regardless of your background or your zip code or your income. And we have, as a country, done an extraordinary job over the last 50 years in improving access to higher education. Today, students are enrolling in post-secondary education, and they are more diverse than they ever have been in our country's history in every sense of that word. The problem is that when we expanded access, we thought we would automatically also expand completion. And it hasn't worked that way. Completion rates have stayed relatively flat in this country for the past 30 years. And since 1975, um, at the national level, gaps in college attainment, have, uh, college completion rates between low-income students and high-income students have doubled since 1995. So, powerful picture, but we've only, we've only really worked on half, half of the problem or half of the challenge. And if you look at what that means, and I know you all have done some research looking at this for, for South Texas and for El Paso, but nationally, for right now, only 44 of every 100 students, uh, of, of, of every 100 young adults earns any kind of credential beyond high school by the time they reach 26 years old. And of those who earn a degree, just 19 of them are black or Hispanic, and only nine of them nationally are from low-income families. And so El Paso's numbers are really not all that different um, than, the rest of the, than the rest of the nation. And this means that we really face what my boss, Bill Gates, would call a wicked problem, which is how we can now, at this moment of declining resources, simultaneously do three things together. Ex keep expanding access, improve completion, and also improve the quality, uh, the quality of learning at a time when we don't have many more resources to spend. And that's really why I was so interested in being here with you today. Um, you know, our work at the Gates Foundation in Higher Education focuses very much on the same kinds of challenges that you are dealing with. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about what our post-secondary uh, work entails. You may or may not know that the, the way the foundation started in the United States was with the Gates Millennial Scholars Program, which is a billion dollar investment, a billion dollars that um, Bill and Melinda committed to scholarships for students, uh, for students of color, underrepresented students, to take them through um, college and through graduate school. So it pays for all of their higher education costs as far as they go. And it's a commitment that will last for 20 years and will fund, uh, will fund higher education for up to 20,000 students. And we're just in the process of beginning to think about how we might imagine a V2.0 of that, of that scholarship program. And then since 2008, we've also added a core um, programmatic grant program on higher education, on post-secondary, called post-secondary success. And we came to that program after Warren Buffett made his extraordinary gift to the foundation in 2008. And Bill and Melinda stepped back from the traditional work that the foundation had been doing in high school reform uh, and asked, what else? You know, what else should this foundation be doing to increase opportunity in America? And I was lucky enough to come to the foundation to lead a team of people to figure out an answer to that question. And for the first year that I was there, we, we thought of, we looked at every possible thing you might imagine the foundation might do. Housing, health care, education. But the key statistic that struck us so much was what was happening to socioeconomic mobility in the country and the fact that it's going down. And if you're born poor in America today, you're more likely to stay poor than at any other time in our history, 
and then in most other industrial countries in the world. And when we pulled apart that data, of course, we found what you know already, which is the single biggest predictor of upward mobility is the education level of, of someone's parents. And as we kept looking more and more at the data, what we saw was that if you are born to a low-income family, if you don't get some kind of credential beyond high school by the time you're 26 years old, your chances of ever getting one go dramatically down. And so it was that that the foundation decided to focus on as our key goal for this post-secondary initiative, which is to dramatically increase the numbers of low-income young adults who get a credential beyond high school by the time they're 26. That means they can earn enough to support themselves and their children at above poverty wages. So it could be an apprenticeship, it could be a one-year certificate, it could be a two-year degree, or a four-year degree. Um, but it's a, it's a critically uh, important objective for the foundation, and we really did come to believe that that focus represents in some ways, if you think about it, the last best chance for those young adults to make a, an effective transition into adulthood and the first best chance for their children. Because often low-income student, low-income young people start their families early. And so if you could do one thing that would make a difference to both generations, it would be that thing. So that's our focus. And our early uh, grant making, our early stage grant making has focused primarily on two-year colleges, much to the disappointment of many four-year institutions, especially as Diana and I were talking about um, earlier today, many of the elite private four-year institutions who do such a good job with um, student success and completion. And not to demean the good job that they do in any way, shape, or form, but one of the reasons that we chose to focus on public institutions, and in particular on community colleges, is because they enroll very large numbers of students, almost seven million students, or about um, a little less than half of all undergraduates in the United States. And if you're low income, um, very often that's the place that you start college. And now we are increasingly kind of lifting up our eyes to think more about uh, four-year institutions as well, and in particular, how important transfer from two-year colleges to four-year colleges is. Because what you really want is to put young people on a pathway that goes as far and as high as they want to go. And then we're also working to um, bring our work together more closely with our, our long-standing investments in improving K-12 education um, at the foundation. And John has been a critical partner in that. But our ultimate goal is to move ever closer to a, a system of education, not just higher education, that provides a path to upward mobility for all. And that's why things like you know, early college high schools, I'm such a believer in how important, uh, how important they are. So like many of you, um, I have been at this for a long time. My whole professional um, career, I've been working on various kinds of um, initiatives that try to create a better pipeline uh, to opportunity. I did a lot of work on school to career um, many, many years ago, on early college high schools. And sometimes I step back and I think, you know, after 25 years, do I feel good about where we are or do I feel discouraged? And I have to say that even um, in these terrible and tough times, I feel very, very optimistic, actually, that we are beginning as a country to see the problems and the ch th this particular challenge and how much it matters to our future. So I want to give you four reasons why I'm optimistic that we um, can make progress. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we see happening around the country that, that give me hope in each of them. Um, the first one is that we know much, much more than we used to know about how, how to structure students' experience to make it more likely that they complete college. And that's in part what early college high schools does. It's, it's a structure that makes it likely and not miraculous that a student would accelerate progression into and through college. So that's the first thing. The second is that we, we are learning so much more about how to create effective teaching and learning. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Third, we're getting better at using data to target interventions and to figure out what works. And then finally, I'm optimistic and inspired by because there are communities like you to learn from. And while you were a, a leader, an early pioneer, there are more and more communities that are kind of coming into this work and this journey, and that makes me very optimistic. So a little bit about just this, this issue of structure and how to structure um, the student experience. And this is, you know, obviously not saying anything to you that you don't know. But one reason why completion rates are so low in this country 
is that the way that we deliver higher education hasn't changed to accommodate who today's students are. And they commute. They're first generation students. Most of them are working in order to pay to put themselves through college. They're caring for a parent or a child. And that kind of student, all told, 75% of all undergraduates in America fit that profile, what we used to call non-traditional students. And they really are the new majority. But although times have changed and students have changed, our post-secondary system hasn't, hasn't caught up. And we don't, in fact, even when we collect data on college, we don't even count those students. As you know, all the statistics that you use and others use to benchmark whether we're making progress count first-time, full-time uh, students. So this is one reason why we are so focused uh, on um, trying to lift up and help support new models for serving this kind of student well. Because we think we really need to, almost in a sense, re-engineer the education pipeline backwards from the goal of post-secondary completion. Um, and to turbocharge the use of time and the results achieved in that time. And I know that many of you are already engaged in this, starting way back in middle school, as you should, or, be, or, or even before that, and thinking about how to help high school students get ready to and prepare for the college experience. You're thinking about new ways to help students qualify for financial aid and working on dual enrollment and early college programs so college, students can get a head start on college-level work and college-level credits. But there's much, much more to do. And at the foundation, we've been um, studying the key places where the greatest numbers of students, um, in essence, sort of fall out of the pipeline. And right now, we're very focused on three key challenges. The first one is helping students make better and more informed choices about where to go to college, when to go to college, and that they should go to college right as they leave high school. Uh, Second, making sure that they can make progress with the maximum momentum once they are enrolled in colleges. And third, um, really drawing the best R&D that we possibly can to improving remedial education or developmental education, those three big loss points. And just, you know, starting for a second with the issue of information, you know, students when they get ready to go to college really get terrible, terrible information about where to go, how to pay for it, what the track record of colleges um, that they apply to is with a student like them. And we don't make it very, uh, very easy for, for them to understand that. And if you think about it, uh, just to give you a couple of really tragic examples, every year um, over 400,000 students in America, low-income students, graduate in the top fifth of, their, fifth of their class and never apply to college at all. 400,000 top achieving students. Um, every year, 1.2 million students who could qualify for FAFSA, for federal aid, don't even fill out the FAFSA form. And this is a place where institutions really differ greatly and whether they organize themselves to help make that possible. 98% uh, of all students who go to a, a, a for-profit two-year institution fill out a FAFSA. Statistic for community colleges, 44% of students who go there fill out a FAFSA form that would give them access to financial aid. So we have funded and um, we're working uh, now to help scale this uh, project with H&R Block that would, would help low-income families when they fill out their tax form, just pre-populate, use that information and right then and there pre-populate the form for the FAFSA um, and, and fill it out and be able to submit it. And the U.S. Department of Education is now expanding this uh, as a pilot. And one of the other things they're doing is once students fill out the FAFSA form and they choose their first, their top three choices of where to go, um, they populate the completion rate uh, at those kinds of institutions um, for students. So a beginning attempt to try to get better and more information out there. But another example, you know, too often students delay starting college after high school. They think they need to work, they're tired of school, it didn't make them feel good about themselves. And we all need to do, to do a much better job of helping them know what we know, which is that if you wait one year to, after high school to start post-secondary education, your chances of completing a BA degree go down by 50%. And if you wait another year, they go down by another 50%. And if you wait to enroll in a traditional BA program until you're 26 years old, your chance of ever getting a degree are 3%. And I know you have done, uh, 
a bit of a look at that here, where I think you're 21% more likely to complete a credential, post-secondary credential, if you go to college right after high school. Your students here who wait, I, I think those who wait, only 1% of them have completed a credential within six years of graduating high school. So that's a simple piece of information that young people don't know, where they're making what feel like really a rational choice. Take time, earn money, save money, take a break, I can always go back. And it's a choice that really slows them down because life gets in the way, uh, as, we, as we all know. So we're, a variety of kinds of investments that we're making try to aim at, at much better and more effective ways of getting information in the hands of students. But a second piece of structuring their experience for success is to make sure that once they do enroll, they have a smoother pathway. You know, I think we have in higher education done what we've done um, so often in, in, in our country in general, which is we, we put such a premium on choice that we've actually created an incredibly confusing and chaotic um, experience for students. And they really experience their college journey as just swirling through separate kinds of courses without easy ways to navigate. And so some of the models that we've been looking at um, take some kinds of the attributes that you could see also in early college high schools, but there are things within colleges that colleges are increasingly looking at uh, where they're creating very, very structured um, programs so that students, instead of entering and taking a series of courses, make a choice about entering a program of study. And once they've chosen that program of study, that's the, big, that's the one big choice they make, and then almost everything else for them uh, follows from that. So you look at examples that a couple of community colleges in Washington have, or the Tennessee Tech Centers, which are one um, example, where students enroll in a course of study, and then what they experience is that every day, for the time they're enrolled in that, their classes meet from 9 to 2. So every day, every, every semester, they can tell their employers that's going to be their schedule, or they can pick their kids up at the school bus, they know what it is. Every class they need to earn their degree for their major is offered every semester that they need it in the sequence that they need it. They enroll as cohorts, um, they're faculty, so they um, know each other well, they, they build a strong kind of social network with each other, and their faculty know both the students and other faculty teaching the students who are moving through that program of study. They know them very well. And I think these are examples of the kinds of things that we need to look at and think about more seriously um, if we're, going to make it, if we're going to make the kinds of shifts that we, uh, that we hope to do. So CUNY, uh, the community college system in New York City has a similar approach called its ASAP program, which is a, it's designed for accelerated progress towards degrees. And you know, similarly, they have block scheduling, students enroll as cohorts, they have very intrusive advising and, and uh, directed choice, and they have graduation rates which are three times higher than students that go through the, the, Q, the CUNY system in a similar way. So that's the, the sort of first thing that makes me optimistic is this increasing willingness to challenge ourselves um, about how, how we, how higher education structures the student experience once students come onto the campus. But of course, structuring the right pathway um, through college isn't enough. We have to pay a lot more attention to what happens inside the classrooms. Um, and this, I think, you know, the second key challenge that we have is how do we take everything that we've been learning about how the brain works and about how effective teaching and learning happens and use it to improve the quality of student learning. So one of the big investments that we've been making at the foundation is to um, support people who are redesigning courses that are the biggest loss points for students. Developmental math, developmental English, and the 24 sort of gatekeeper courses, the big intro courses that constitute the first two years of what most students take, whether they're at an associate, at, at a community college or a four-year institution. Um, because they have terrible completion rates. And we are uh, making a range of investments in partners uh, in colleges and universities around the country, but one of the most exciting ones is work that we're doing with Carnegie Mellon University. I don't know how many of you have heard anything about their open learning initiative. Do you know about this? So this is uh, a really interesting thing that they've been doing where they've, they've developed hybrid models that combine um, online digital, digital learning with classroom-based learning to accelerate student learning. Um, and they, they, when they started out, they took a college statistics course and they taught it in two ways. So they had a kind of control experiment um, right within their own uh, college. 
and they used comparable groups of students. And the first group was a traditional class, lasted 15 weeks, four class meetings a week, um, and then they had a hybrid class that uh, used online course material, and it held two classroom sessions a week, which, and it lasted half as long. It lasted seven weeks, seven and a half weeks. And the, mo the, the uh, experiment, the model, dramatically improved course retention and completion rates, and it improved students' mastery of subject material. So when they were tested on that material six or seven weeks after they had finished the course, they remembered what they had learned better from the shorter course. And the reason for this was the way that they structured the online learning work. What they did is they brought together a group of cognitive scientists who understand uh, learning, curriculum designers, and then content specialists, in this case, math professors, statistic professors. And they created an intelligent tutoring system. So when the student did the online work, what they essentially were doing was practicing and practicing and practicing the concepts that they were um, being taught during the lecture, but in a way that scaffolded it so that they were basically learning how to think like a subject matter expert, how to solve, how to approach and solve those problems in the way that someone who was expert in the field would solve them. And uh, so they, they, were, they would get a series of prompts and it would take them to the next level deeper, the next level deeper, but then even more powerful, what the technology allowed the professor to do was to look across all the students in that class during that week so that when they came in for that lecture class on the Monday, they knew exactly where the students were struggling and they weren't teaching sort of just in case a lecture at blank faces with no sense of whether they were connecting with the students or not, but they could really understand what they needed to focus that limited class time uh, on. And then at the end of the semester, the math department was able to look across all of that and ask itself, how could we redesign our statistics course so it can be more effective, a more effective course for teaching and learning? So we are working now with Carnegie Mellon to take that similar kind of methodology and try to apply it to developmental math and developmental English courses. And they are um, starting to work on other, uh, other kinds of interventions as well. But any, any college or university that has cognitive scientists and curriculum designers, educators who think about curriculum design and content experts could do this kind of work. And they're finding that for many faculty members, this is really actually an incredibly exciting thing because it gives the faculty an ability to understand much better than they have had before the, the kind of impact they're making on their students. So last uh, example that I would use is just this example of data and using data to target interventions at the places where they can make them the biggest impact. And I think that's going to be increasingly important as we have more limited resources because over time, colleges are going to have to decide to take resources away from things that are less effective in supporting student learning and student success and move those resources towards things that are going to be that are more effective that their own evidence um, shows them and you know this is uh, happens in many colleges I could I should be and I could be giving examples from right here but I'm going to use an example from another community college Valencia uh, one of our uh, the colleges that we partner with, and they did a lot of looking at um, what were predictors of student success there. And what they saw was that getting through the first five courses that students take on their first try was the single biggest predictor of success. And so they re-engineered all their registration processes. Uh, they set in place kind of early warning systems where if they saw that students were dropping behind in the first few weeks, they swarmed all over those students to get them back on track again. And that's a good example of, of really um, mobilizing the college to, to support students at the front door uh, instead of letting them make their way through the institution. So all of these, I think, you know, are examples of the kinds of things that make me, uh, make me optimistic of what we can and, and should be doing together. But, you know, communities like this one, are the, are the fourth uh, example of what, me make, of what makes me feel so optimistic. Because you know, if you, you sort of see you all from the outside, as someone like, like I um, have seen you, you do amazing things consistently over and over again. And one of them, uh, one of my favorite uh, lines from Tom Stopper, the, the, uh, the playwright, from a play that's just being um, brought back again on, uh, in New York, which is called Arcadia, which I've never seen, but I've just read this. Uh, he says, it is the wanting to know that makes us matter. And I think, you know, one of the things that impresses me so much about all of you is you want to know. You want to know who, 
you can do a better job with. You want to know why they're falling behind if they're falling behind. You want to know how. You can put in place interventions that are going to help them. And you have systematically over time collected that kind of information, not just in one institution, but in the partnership between UTEP and you at El Paso Community College and the regional districts. So you've, you have that um, wanting to know and you have systematically um, built a discipline of asking for evidence and getting evidence and using it. And then the second thing that you have is you have the capacity to organize for action and to start to aim your action at the things that are going to make the biggest difference. And you've done a lot of that, but you also have data that's beginning to show you even more things you could do, like making sure students enroll in some kind of college directly after high school if they're not lucky enough to go to an early college high school, um, making sure they qualify for all the financial aid that they possibly can get, making sure they get 20 or 30 credits in that first critical year um, when they're enrolled in college, et cetera. And then last, I think, you know, having, having organized to take action, you have the capacity to sustain, to sustain it and improve it over time. And that's really, that's really hard. And so many communities have so much to learn from you uh, as a result of that. And I think, you know, just um, when I think about the things that, that counter my optimism, I think the biggest thing that we are all up against in many ways is two things. One is just our complacency as a country that we have a great higher education system, best in the world, doing an incredible job. And the disconnect between looking at who our, who our future is, who our young people are, how they're changing from the traditional students of before, how critically important it's going to be to, to educate well all students, especially in growing underserved populations like Hispanic populations, which you all have done such a good job um, in innovating and improving. Uh, and then I think our, our attitude, and we've done a lot of um, focus group work at the foundation as we think about how to help the country pay better attention to these, where we really, really actually believe that if a student fails, it's the student's fault. It's their responsibility. And we, we have not looked at the things that institutions do that make a difference for student success. So we've, you know, we, lots of reasons for optimism, but there are lots and lots of challenges um, out there in front of us. So I want to close uh, by just showing a video that um, we developed together with Good Magazine. And it's, it's our attempt to start to solicit um, the voices of students and show some of the kinds of success stories of students. And I think it sums up a lot of what we've been talking about today. So thanks to your great guys back there. I can show Because, you know, I think for all of us, 
the great opportunity and the great challenge for those of us that are in philanthropy or on, in institutions like yours is that we need to be heroes so they don't have to be. Thank you. Okay, so the floor is open for questions. Anyone like to step up and be the first? That's always the hardest one. If you go to the microphone, John. Okay, opa, oop. Concerning I was playing basketball 10 years ago and today I can't walk, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> I was an engineering educator for many years and there were two things that I, I kind of wanted to hear you talk about today. And I'm gonna put them to you in two questions quickly. One of them is the troublesome problem of universities bidding against each other, using scholarships to bid against each other for good students, that bothers me. Because that takes money away that could be used for other students. Mm -hmm. The second one is, you alluded to it in some places, but I have found in my experience that good programs had good counselors, and I want to put a hyphen there, counselor mentors, because a mentor stays with this kid forever. So those are two of my questions. Comment on So, great question. So the first question was um, had to do with the sort of um, unproductive kind of game and war that institutions play with each other and using scholarship to sort of game the system, boost their ratings, compete in unproductive ways uh, against each other. And I couldn't agree with you more. You know, if you look at higher, it, it is remarkable how responsive higher education is to reputation. Um, and so we have been trying to think hard about whether there might be ways to change the metrics that, um, that are considered things that colleges are valued for. We haven't really figured that out because there is kind of a juggernaut of US News and World Report kinds of ratings, but I think you're starting to see some better things. Um, there's a magazine called Washington Monthly that unfortunately isn't read by many, but it started to, to sort of add some different, some different categories. So I think A, the, um, the ways in which financial aid is uh, manipulated are really bad the ways that many states are backing away from need-based aid and you know, really putting more of their limited financial aid dollars into merit-based aid, really bad. Um, so we'd love to talk more about how an organization like our organization could be helpful on that issue, but we haven't really figured out, um, we haven't figured that out for, for ourselves, but I agree with you, it's a critical, it's a critical issue. And then to your comment about counselors, mentors, I, I think that's a hugely, hugely uh, important issue and you know, if you think about what you all, you know, what each of the institutions represented here has done, you have figured out incredible ways to surround young adults with people who, people who see them, who won't let them fall through the cracks. So I think that's a, that's a very big piece of um, what we look for when we, we look at some of the kinds of structures we think are the most important, because there are structures that make that um, the normal part of a student's experience. And we were talking earlier today uh, actually about the example of um, some of the students here who are really mentoring each other uh, and, and seeing where, they, where students like them stung, stumble. And um, are you you're Roberto, uh, who, had, who did this, um, what he saw for a lot of the early college high schools, I may not get this exactly right, is that they took their chemistry class early in their time. And when they came here and they were ready to take organic chem, it had been so long since they took chemistry that they really had a much harder time um, succeeding. So he organized a two week uh, tutorial really for them so that he could help tutor them and get them, remind them of what it is they had learned so that they could enter in a more successful way. And I think, you know, if you think about um, all the roles that students could play on on-campus jobs, if we thought about ways to use work-study dollars for that kind of retention or progression specialist, <laughs> Um, you know, I think that's another form of, of mentoring that could be powerful and is relatively underutilized. So thank you. Another one. Thanks for coming today. 
I hope this isn't your last visit to the campus. I hope it's not my last visit. I'm, I know it's not my last visit. I want to tell you a little story and then ask you a question. Um, years ago, I was on a flight from Seattle to New York, and I was fortunate to be sitting next to a young woman. Turns out she was 28. Uh, I don't normally ask women sitting next to me their age, but, um, <laughs> but the story here is that she was a Microsoft employee, began working at Microsoft when she was 18, had engaged at Microsoft in what was called, at, this is her discussion with me, a 30-30 program, where she went to the University of Washington, worked 30 hours a week on a full-time salary at Microsoft, and was in a 30-hour, so she had a commitment of 60 hours a week, took five years to complete her degree, hmm. but at this point, at the age of 28, she had been a Microsoft employee for 10 years, was a vice president of the business, and managed four accounts, the New York Stock Exchange, the Harvard Business School, <laughs> <laughs> a defense and artificial intelligence center in, in Pittsburgh, and I forget what the fourth was. Is the foundation working at all? Because you began this mm -hmm. with what we all know. Most of these young men and women who are, do not have the gift or the endowment to simply walk into a higher education institution and have it funded. Mm -hmm. Are either supported by loans, which are quite frankly challenging thought yeah. for many of the students today. Um, they really work, and they're working 20, 30 hours a week to move through this challenge. Is the foundation working at all with corporations to come to the realization that this national challenge of ours is not a challenge in mm -hmm. higher education, it's a challenge in the integration of enterprise in higher education? Yes, we are. So um, it's a bad time in the economy to be trying to do that, but th the, the form of education and learning that you described, which you, know, you could think of as co-op education in some way, but a way that because students have to work, could you imagine them working in the job for which they were preparing um, and getting to know the company? We think that's a hugely uh, valuable and important thing. So we have started with a couple of grants that are working in the energy sector and um, with manufacturing thinking a lot about health and whether there's ways to, to think about health careers that could work more that way. Um, but what that will require is uh, organizing kind of intermediaries, whether that's in the college, you know, or some organization in a community that can help put those things together and make them work easily. So we, we are very interested in that um, and still in the process, you know, we've got some small investments there, but. Uh, hope to be doing much, much more there. And I think you're absolutely, that, that would be the highest and best uh, thing that I think employers could do. And there are many relatively simpler things that they could do. You know, they could say, if I have a young worker, and even if I don't have a, uh, an, you know, almost in a sense, an apprenticeship program like that, I won't change their shift um, if they're enrolled. You know, I won't change their shift for the semester that they're enrolled in. Or if I have a tuition reimbursement program, I'll prepay their tuition. You know, I think that's, that's part of the kind of thing if, we, if, we, if you could imagine the pledge that all different sectors of a community might make around young people if they were really, if a community were really to try to greatly increase the number of its young adults who had achieved a credential early in their 20s. I think it's going to take many, many um, contributors. And interestingly, one of our grantees has been doing um, research on the forms of social capital that help young people go to and through college. And you know, not surprisingly, for high-income youth, um, the biggest forms of social capital are their, their families and their teachers. And for low-income young people, those actually turn out to be negative sources of, of human capital. Their teachers have low expectations of them and communicate that. And often for their families, they're not so sure about higher education. It's not in, the, in necessarily the experience of the family, and they may think they need the, their, their student to work. So the three biggest sources of positive social capital for going to college for lower income students are their employers, their coaches, and faith-based leaders in their communities. But those are people who, if you think about it, really don't have access to any of the kind of statistics that we've just been talking about now, or, or any short list of simple things they could do, or complicated ones, that could make a difference for young people. So, you know, hopefully we, we and others can help draw those kinds of linkages more. You have other other questions? Yes. I happen to have those kids that are coming up 
from high school. I have two in high school and one just started college. And one of them in particular cannot sit through a class for the whole semester. I've been told over and over how intelligent he is and he has zeros on every other assignment. But when you put him in a class during the summer to make that up and it's online, mm -hmm. you can ask him a year later and he remembers everything. He had A's in everything he did that day, that, that month. And I just think it's so tremendous and it's such an important thing that we've got to do that and prepare. We, we gave them TV and iPhones and Xboxes and we're giving everything at a thousand miles an hour and then we go sit them in a classroom at a half a mile an hour. Yeah. I don't think lecture can go away. It's got to be part of it. But I'm, I'm really concerned that that still is such a large part. Do you work with schools and how to go backwards because you know they're already using the things there it's very expensive and very difficult to try to change what's already in place. What kinds of things have you helped other districts or, so that yeah. when they're finished, they can walk in the door here and be prepared for what we're already offering them, right. which is a combination of all those things? You know, we are doing some work there. Um, we don't, we have a thing called Next Generation Learning Challenges. So it's a, it's a competitive set of grants where we've put three or four, we've put four um, sort of learning challenges out there and try to encourage uh, competition um, for quick turnaround kinds of grants to take something that seems promising and scale it to reach more students. And um, they involve things like digital learning and um, hybrid kinds of forms of online learning, much more interactive and engaging um, uses of technology. And the way that we are envisioning trying to do that work is to then work with partner um, colleges or you, you could imagine um, high schools or districts to help sort of beta test those kinds of, of, uh, of things and help them fail fast and get better fast by using them in real world context. So I think you, you do raise a really critical thing which is just really taking the benefits of, of some of the technologies and making sure that digital natives get to learn that way too. Thank you. It was great to be here. I just want to thank Hillary Pennington again for taking time to come uh, to El Paso. It's, it's been um, a long extended invitation that we've, we've been uh, working on for quite a while and it's just great to have you here. And so I'm going to give Hillary, a, a small token of our appreciation, which is um, the uh, moment in this institution's history when we splashed on the national scene with our basketball team. And since it's now March Madness, this seems like an appropriate gift. So thank oh, you, Hillary. Thank you.